Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now today you join me inside a Land Rover Discovery TD5. Not just any Land Rover though, because this is my one. Six months ago I paid about £3,000 for this off-road vehicle and today I'm going to be talking about my experiences owning it over that period of time, the pros and cons of daily driving such a vehicle like this and whether or not you should buy one if you're looking for something to go off-roading in or just want something as a firm, massive and sturdy family car. So I've learned a lot over the past six months, mainly that a lot of people need things to be taken over the dump. In the period of time I've owned it, I must have taken a few tons worth of rubbish over the local waste disposal site. And the practicality of this vehicle pretty much means that it's already paid for itself. This one has become a little bit of a workhorse and I will admit I haven't really looked after it as well as I intended to upon my initial purchase. So, spec wise, this is the 2002 Adventure model. It features the 2.5 litre TD5 diesel engine, a five cylinder engine that produces about 135 brake horsepower. Now they also do a V8 version of this exact vehicle. It comes in both a manual and automatic transmission as well. This is the automatic version. Now this is a four speed auto box and with all automatics, it's probably not as snappy as the manual version of this car. What I'm gonna do now is talk you through the car from front to back, um, show you the inside of it a little bit more and then we'll take it for a drive. So the best place to start is the exterior. Every mark and scratch you see was likely caused by me whilst off-roading. Some people say why don't I get the dents fixed, but honestly, I bought this for off-road fun, and to me a Land Rover isn't quite a Land Rover without its fair share of blemishes. Having said that, I do plan on replacing this door, as I picked up a spare one for just £50, and because it's a discovery, replacing that is as simple as removing and replacing a few bolts. I've already replaced the cracked silver bumper it originally had on it with this black one, giving it a more rugged look, though it seems I've lost a headlight washer here. Not to worry though, because parts for these are mostly cheap and plentiful. I've also added these wind deflectors which I picked up for just a few pounds. But now we must take an adventure inside and discover the many functions and quirks of this vehicle. This model features beige half leather design complemented by imitation varnished walnut effect trim. The 4-speed gearbox features the usual PRND setup, along with a few lower range gears and a mode button that puts the car into sports mode or manual mode, depending on whether you are in high or low range. That is controlled by this stick here and should be kept in high range when driving normally on the roads. Moving back to the centre console and you've got the standard electric window controls, as well as a child lock button that stops the rear windows from opening and thus your child falling out. Back up front and we have a broken cigarette lighter, that fact is important later. And what you may think is a huge glove box considering the size of the car, when in actual fact you can fit approximately one small box and a tape in here. Along the doors is a small speaker, an oddly tiny storage hole and a large speaker. It's the same for both sides, though you do get the standard storage bin along the bottom too. Mine are filled with leaves. Now as I mentioned briefly there, the door handles, they are very awkward to get to. If you are sitting in the car, these come up to about my knees. So you have to really lurch forward just to open your door. And it can be a little bit awkward. Another awkward feature is the seat handles. In the premium model, the seats are electric, but us cheapskates have to deal with this plastic flimsy handle that feels like it's going to snap off every time you adjust your position. Perhaps this random space that leads to absolutely nowhere under the seat is for storing spare handles. Continuing on the interior tour and let's talk about what else you get. Starting with the buttons on and around the wheel. The obvious one is the horn. Land Rover gives you two of these in case you get extra angry in traffic and want to give your thumbs a good workout. Careful though because they're liable to fall off. The buttons, not your thumbs. We've also got the radio controls on the wheel including volume, mode and frequency selectors. The other side features the cruise control buttons which is activated elsewhere. That elsewhere is behind the wheel among the rear washer and rear wiper buttons. Cruise control can be activated at over 30 miles per hour. On the other side we have the front and rear fog light controls and a couple of blank switches, one of which is likely reserved for a parking sensor switch which was a feature once again only available in higher end models. The instrument cluster is pretty basic which is good because all you need to keep an eye on in a discovery is the temperature and fuel gauges. There is a spider living behind mine. 
The indicators and front wiper controls are on stalks each side of the wheel. But now let's discuss the more fun features as well as some odd quirks. One mildly infuriating thing is the clock. You'd think these buttons would adjust the hour and minute, but no, they don't move. To adjust the time, you need to stick something small and thin in these holes on top of these fake buttons, and the single previous owner managed to get a paper clip jammed in there, hence the clock is 3 hours and 10 minutes behind. At least I can still work it out. Next to that is the handy unlock or lock all doors feature, which is sometimes necessary because it can be easy to forget that a single press of the key only unlocks the driver door. In the middle, under the radio controls, we have the Land Rover heating system. Interestingly, this works in a peculiar way. You turn it on as normal and adjust your heat or coolness as desired. Funny thing is, if I turn it to high and then switch it off, the car still gets roasting hot inside, so I have to make sure to set it to a desired temperature before turning it off again. Ah, Land Rover quirks. There's also a little hook here to hang the world's smallest pair of trousers. On the other side we have the rear demister and my favourite button, the fuel release door, which of course only works when the ignition is off, or at least it should do. Being a four-wheel drive, you also get downhill descent control, which keeps the car at a steady speed down a slippery slope without driver aid, and this button which raises the back of the car up an extra three or four inches to help you out of any sticky off-road situations. The rear suspension is made up of two airbags, one above each wheel, whereas the front of the car is on springs. Whilst these airbags are handy, they are prone to failing, and I came out of my house the other day to find the car had sunk on one side at the rear. There is also plenty of room in the back for all the family, and one nice feature I like is this centre storage box turned picnic table, complete with a tray and two cup holders. It's perfect for when you pull up to a nice scenic picnic spot with the family, only to forget that this is England and it starts raining, so you have to eat in the car. Now although it's spacious when you're actually sitting up here, getting in and out can be a bit awkward. The wheel arches have to be high to accommodate the large wheels, and so they stick up between the door and the seat limiting the entry space. I can't moan, I mean I only ever drive, but if you want to buy one as a family vehicle and have elderly relatives, they might struggle to get in and out. What I mean by the back seats is this, if you're slightly larger, such as myself, you may find it a little bit of a squeeze to get in, but once you're in, there's plenty of room for everyone. Before getting to the very back of the car, I'd like to discuss the roof because there are a few cool things up here too, like the extra storage above the sun visors. I like to keep a map of all the byways up here for off-roading purposes. There's also a front sunroof and a rear sunroof, both of which are controlled manually. Again, because this isn't the premium model, you have to open both sunroofs using these handles. If you're absolutely melting on a hot summer's day, the energy required to open these might just finish you off, especially if your handles have stiffened up a bit like my ones. Also, above the rear passenger seats are these handy storage nets and mesh pullouts that cover up the aforementioned sunroofs. You may have noticed the saggy headlining in some areas too, a very common occurrence in these. Moving right round to the back, and there is of course plenty of storage space here too, which can be kept as such or transformed into more seating thanks to these pull-out side seats. Granted there isn't a ton of space to sit back here, but there are some cool features like a 12 volt charger, as well as individual headphone jacks and radio controls, both of which still work. The seats are pretty simple to pull out and put away, and just involve twisting the handle release here. There's also a pair of pull down headrests that come down from the roof. So we've seen the inside, but let's take this out for a drive. I apologise for the uh, inevitably bumpy camera here, but let me tell you a little bit about how this vehicle drives. Now in terms of acceleration, you're not going to be getting anywhere very quickly, as expected in a car like this. Yet you're probably not going to want to, as the old saying goes, with a Land Rover you can go fast but I can go anywhere. And that is definitely true in something like this that is actually honestly quite a fantastic off-roader as well. Not as good as a Land Rover Defender, which are significantly more expensive, especially since they've stopped making them now, but these are still pretty good in their own right. Now I talk about the acceleration as if it's poor, but in all honesty, a Volkswagen Golf pulled up alongside at the lights the other day next to me, and he had a smug look on his face. He, he seemed to think he was gonna outrun me at those set of lights. Now I didn't particularly hurry, but let's just say I slammed my foot down on the accelerator well within 
legal limits of course and he had to pull in behind me now i looked in my rear view mirror and i saw him chuckling away to himself i don't think he expected the sheer power that came from this land rover on that day that's not to say it's going to be a volkswagen golf or really any other hot hatchback production car on any other day it was just that on that day this decided to really give that car a run for its money so just know that if you do want a little burst of power it is there especially if you decide to absolutely hammer your foot down now the top speed of this vehicle is 98 miles an hour you're not going to really want to sit at any more than 60 or 70 on a dual carriageway or motorway the thing about this is that the rear suspension is made up of two air balloons it's on air at the back um, these can deflate over time and you may find your Land Rover sinking one side when you go out to your driveway in the morning I haven't had any problems like that so far but what it does mean for the actual comfort of this vehicle is that as you're turning around corners you don't so much turn them as you do roll round them now I don't find that a comfort issue myself but I have had some passengers say that they do sort of wobble all over the place and if you look in your mirror you can see people bouncing about all over the place like this up here in the cockpit it's not really that bad of an issue but it's not as comfortable as say a family minivan or something with springs all round of course you can convert this to springs all round but the ride will be a little bit harder and you won't get the benefits of some of the features down here including the rear three inch lift which can really get you out of some sticky situations i've never been in a situation whereby an extra three inches hasn't come in handy now what i will say is that this is a slightly noisier land rover than what you may usually hear with the discovery i'm not sure what it is about this one but it does seem to be particularly loud if i just roll my window down a little bit and accelerate it is rather rambunctious in terms of noise levels that being said it's practical the ride is fairly smooth i mean there's so many potholes in England that you go over them in this and you'll barely feel it, same as speed bumps. There's plenty of space inside for all of your family and with those rear seats in back too, you can fit up to seven people inside this thing and still have room to perhaps play your PSP or PlayStation Vita on your lap if that's something people still do. Now I used to have an old Range Rover before this, say a P38, one of the most unreliable models, on paper at least, and let me just say that yes, my one was hideously unreliable. It featured a little more space, but it just wasn't as comfortable as this. Now as I mentioned before, you may find yourself rolling about a little bit, but to be honest, aside from that, you feel quite safe. The thing with big cars is that not everyone likes them because they can be a bit of an eyesore on the roads. I know my nan, for example, she sees a big car on the road and she's like, why does that person on their own need a car of such size? But honestly, after getting in this and then getting back in something smaller, you do, you do feel a lot more vulnerable. And it's such a nice sensation climbing back into something like this and just thinking, I feel safe. Now I'm just about to pull back onto the single carriageway and it's a perfect time to talk more figure-wise about the speed and 0 to 60 times of this vehicle. Now on paper, Land Rover say you'll achieve a 0 to 60 speed of about 15 seconds. That'll be slightly faster in the manual version of this car, but I have to say that yes, it does feel like it does it in about that time. Um, as I mentioned before, speed isn't really a concern with something like this. Uh, the main concerns are the comfort to me and the off-road capabilities which I won't be testing out today but I will have a future video based solely on that subject. I mean I said that but it's so hard to not be tempted just to take it off-road whenever you're out in one of these. It's just an all-round decent sized fun vehicle to own and although the running costs are a little high um, especially if you're using it every day and making long commutes to work that feature country roads and winding towns as well as villages you are going to see your bills increase not to mention that the repairs you may have to carry out frequently in the six months i've owned this i've had to pay out for a new starter motor already um, but this is still one of the favorite cars that i've ever owned and I can't quite put my finger on why. All I know is that this combines the perfect mix of practicality, 
as well as fun. And that's all I can say. Now something I touched on just then, but I really feel like I should expand on, is the running costs of the vehicle itself. As you can see, I'm out of the car now, and this was a little bit of an afterthought, but it's important to know how much it's going to cost you to run one of these, as it may put you off, depending on how you feel about having an empty wallet at the end of every month. So, I paid £3,000 for this car, and at the time I insured it, I was 23 years old. Here in the UK, to insure myself on a Land Rover, at 23 years old, it cost me about £1,000. This is with a couple of years no claims bonus. Now to run it, I put about £40 of diesel in it every week. So that's about £160 a month in fuel. As I mentioned before, I do a lot of town driving. I live separately to my mum and I usually drive around there most nights. And it's trips like that that will really decrease your overall miles to the gallon, which as it stands is about 20 on average. On a longer run, if you're going on holiday, you can expect to get 30 to 35, even in the auto version. And of course, Land Rover are hardly famed for their reliability, so I would set aside a certain budget each month for repair costs. As I mentioned, I already had to put a new starter motor in this thing, but because it's a Land Rover, they're easier to work on. So a lot of the work can be done yourself if you read up on it a little bit or know what you're doing. Despite this, and despite the fact that it's eating away at my bank account, I just can't bring myself to sell it. It's one of those vehicles I'm always going to own, even if I end up getting another little car to drive while I'm not driving that. It's just too much of a handy thing to have in your life. And I think if you buy one, you really will enjoy it. Just look out for ones that have decent service history and perhaps lowish miles. I mean, it doesn't really matter on the TD5 engines. My one's done 141,000 miles now. But all I can say is when you're looking for one, ignore any blemishes or marks that you might see. Don't let that put you off if the engine is solid and it's got a decent service history behind it. All that being said, thank you very much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I do plan to do a lot more videos on this channel now, so that's all I can say. This has been the Land Rover Discovery TD5 review. If you enjoyed it, leave a like down below, leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and I'll see you very soon in the next one.